Yes. So, uh, good morning, good morning, and a very warm welcome to our workshop today. Uh, my name is Guntram Wolf, and I'm the director here at Bruegel, and I would like to welcome all of you very warmly to um, our discussion today on competition policy in the era of AI, artificial intelligence, the case of Japan and Europe. This workshop is co-organized with um, the University of Kobe, and I would like to uh, especially warmly welcome uh, the Dean uh, Nakanishi, uh, the Dean of the Graduate School of Economics. Thank you very much for coming today uh, with your entire team. Also, a very warm welcome to all of our friends from Kobe University that have been here with us already several times. We've had, um, I think, five, five, four or five um, workshops before this one, uh, uh, and so six, six even. Oh, it's the seventh. Oh, my God. Time flies. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's, really, uh, it's really almost a tradition now that um, I, I can say that we, that we meet and that we discuss. Um, we always choose different topics. Um, so you might remember, for example, last time we were discussing, um, uh, we were discussing uh, uh, monetary policy which was a very interesting discussion um, uh, also because Japan, of course, um, has been under, undergoing uh, uh, very um, expansionary and very loose monetary policy together with um, uh, some, some specific fiscal policy. So I think the, the so-called abenomics uh, was, uh, of course, met with huge interest uh, here, here in Europe. Now, this time, uh, we chose a different topic, which is a little bit more uh, technical and which I think many will say uh, might be a bit complicated and we're uh, perhaps wondering what's here the link between Japan and Europe. I think what I, I, I thought I would say uh, to start that topic off is um, give you a, a little quote from... Um, the uh, political uh, mission letter, so the letter that Margrethe Vestager, uh, the uh, current competition commissioner of the European Commission, um, and the future not only competition commissioner but executive vice president of the commission with a mandate to also oversee digital issues and um, uh, more broadly um, industrial policy in Europe. And so in her... Um, in her mission letter, and let me quote here, um, it says, in the first 100 days of our mandate, uh, you, so Margrethe Vestager, so that's what Ursula von der Leyen, the president-elect, has written to Margrethe Vestager, so in the first 100 days of your approach, of our mandate, you will coordinate the work on a European approach on artificial intelligence, including its human and ethical implications. This should also look at how we can use and share non-personalized big data to develop new technologies and business models that create wealth for our societies and our businesses. So, so this is this is the mandate for the new European uh, Commission um, in the in the area of AI um, and and big data. It puts, uh, of course, uh, that was already in the old Commission. It puts a mandate. Um, and an emphasis on uh, the human and ethical implications, which is which is very interesting and perhaps quite unique in the world. But it also talks quite a bit about um, big data um, and um, and how to deal with with data as a basis also for AI. And and that's I think an area where immediately there's also a link with Japan. Uh, why is that? Well, basically because we have an EU Japan. Um, not only trade agreement, but there's an associated agreement um, to that trade agreement. There's an agreement on data exchange, which regulates and allows um, firms uh, in Japan and in Europe to quite freely um, uh, uh, trade data uh, with each other and use these data um, as a base um, uh, for for business and wealth creation, and so so in that sense, there is immediately also a link to the, the to the Japanese um, to Japan from what we see here um, uh, in the in political guidelines for for this new commission. So I think this is a fascinating topic. Um, it is a bit techy. Um, the competition policy discussion in that space, of course, is. Um, uh, is a technical uh, discussion and a very active discussion at this stage um, because um, 
because um, uh, at least on the European side, there has been uh, in the last one or two years a very, very substantial discussion on how to uh, reshape um, the rules of competition policy um, in, this, in this era um, of digital, digital, uh, digitalization and digital firms, um, where uh, I think many in Europe feel that um, uh, we are falling behind. Um, uh, we don't have any of the big platform uh, companies. Um, and, uh, and some people claim that it's down to, uh, to competition policy enforcement. I, I personally don't, don't think so. I think it, uh, it has many other reasons. Uh, and I think to some extent the competition policy debate um, has been misguided um, in, in that space. But I think it, it does, uh, this debate is still a very real and very live debate. And uh, you know, I, I very much uh, look forward to also hearing what, what the debate on this topic is, is in Japan. Now, before I give the floor to um, to Dean and Nakanishi, um, let me say we have, of course, uh, two sessions today. So the first session um, is uh, talking about AI as a new driving force of economic growth. It will be chaired um, by uh, Dr. Pocaro, um, who is um, uh, a long, long-time researcher here at Bruegel and also head of communications and events. And um, the second session will be about EU and Japan, uh, both uh, leaders in the AI development. I think there should be a question mark, um, but um, uh, there isn't at the moment in the program. And it will be chaired by Agata Wierczbowska, who um, is uh, also a long-standing guest here at Bruegel from Kobe University. She is um, a professor at, at Kobe University. So, so thank you so much again to our, our friends uh, from Japan for having come for such a long way. And um, I very much look forward to, to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm Noritsugu Nakanishi, the current dean of the Graduate School of Economics uh, at Kobe Univers University in Japan. So it is my great pleasure and honor to uh, be here and make an opening address uh, for this conference in collaboration with Bruegel. So this conference, uh, conference series began in 2013. So since then, so we have continuously held annual conferences. Hence, so this year's conference comes to the seventh one. Right. So without the incredible effort by Bruegel, so this conference series uh, could not have been possible and successful. First of all, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the director of uh, Bruegel, Dr. Gantram Wolf. Uh, thank you very much, Director Wolf, for all the efforts and the co cooperation. I also appreciate uh, every single effort uh, done by the staff here in Bruegel and there in Kobe. So thank you very much for all of your excellent jobs. Uh, I also also thank the mission uh, mission of Japan to the European Union for its continuous support to the conference. We are uh, very grateful to the continuous financial assistance from uh, various foundations, uh, such as the Japan Foundation, the Toshiba International Foundation, and the Rokodai Foundation. The last one is the Alumni Association of Social Science uh, Colleges in our university. Uh, without their general support, uh, we, the delegates uh, of Kobe University, cannot be here uh, sitting in this room today. The theme of this year's conference is uh, competition policy in the era of AI, the case of Japan and Europe. AI, artificial intelligence, uh, what a fantastic word it is. Uh, thinking back to my childhood or even uh, closer back to my uh, undergraduate age, AI is a word uh, that can be found only in some fancy sci-fi novels or movies, such as a 2001 uh, Space Odyssey written by 
Arthur C. Clarke or Star Wars uh, produced by uh, George Lucas. But uh, because of the rapid and ongoing advancement of computer-based technologies, uh, in particular the advancement of information uh, communication technologies uh, in, these, in these several decades, uh, we are now living in a world that uh, could not have been imagined before. Uh, by the way, so have you ever installed an AI speaker in your residence? No? Actually, I have. <laughs> by, by speaking to it with some magic words such as, OK, Google, hey, Siri, or Excella, Alexa, no, Alexa, Alexa, so we can uh, listen to our favorite music stored in a server in a foreign country. Uh, we can control the temperature in the living room, or even we can order and purchase some pieces of merchandise from abroad by just talking to an AI speaker. Well, AI is no longer a word in the sci-fi world. AI has already begun to change various aspects of our daily lives in the real world. Is it good or not for the international society? Some people are worried about the possibility that the big multinational enterprises such as GAFA, uh, that is Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Apple, uh, dominate and manipulate, man manipulate the world economy by taking advantage of their superior AI technologies and collected big data. Some other people, of course, on the other hand, uh, find the potential of AI technologies for making our daily lives better off. Can we or should we uh, regulate or control the AI technologies and the related transaction uh, through some policy measures? It is an urgent question to be answered. I hope uh, that the presentations and the discussions uh, in this conference would help to understand the situation and to provide some guidelines for a better society in the near future. Although so it has not yet begun, so I'm pretty sure that the conference will be very successful at the end. I really look forward to all the presentations and the discussions uh, to come. I would like to thank all the participants very much in, uh, adv uh, in advance uh, for their invaluable inputs to the conference. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, so, I would like to invite the panelists of the first session to join me on stage. Um, I will also have the chance to present them. Professor Taiji Hagiwara, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, professor of the Graduate School of Economics at the Kobe University. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Taiji. Um, Yuko Kawai, uh, General Manager for Europe and Chief Representative in London of the Bank of Japan. And Gatia Cerere, uh, Professor of Economics at Institute Min Telecom Business School, LITEM. Thank you very much for, for joining me today. And I'm Giuseppe Porcaro, Head of Communications here at Bruegel. Um, and long-standing uh, um, uh, interested person in everything that comes uh, with uh, uh, technology and the impact of digitalization, not only on our daily lives, but on economics and politics. And um, as the scene has been said uh, before uh, about uh, the dramatic changes that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, and might potentially bring to, to our lives, not only on our living room, but actually on the way we are uh, spending money, uh, on the way we are producing, on the way we are basically uh, doing economics in general. So in this first session, we are going to explore a little bit uh, the general issues. We are going to settle a little bit the scene around the topics. And uh, what will interest me, especially since we have a panel that is uh, uh, as this world conference uh, in between Europe and Japan, seeing a little bit how those general issues, which are global concerns, are going to be uh, having some specific perspectives 
on the different sides of the globe and uh, how we can learn from each other. I mean, that, that I hope that we can learn uh, something more on this together and that we, uh, we can also uh, have a, a very lively discussion um, today. Uh, one interesting element which I wanted to uh, uh, push and, and also to send the scene is the fact that just yesterday uh, Nature has been publishing um, an article uh, where uh, they uh, have been reporting that measurements from repeated experiments, I will, I will read it uh, because, because I, I, I don't know it by art, but so uh, measurements from repeated experiments sample, um, sample the resulting probability distribution which, uh, uh, of the Sycamore processor, which is a quantum computing processor owned by Google, actually. And basically, they, they measured that this processor took about 200 seconds to sample one instance of a quantum circuit of a million times. So the benchmarks actually currently indicate that the equivalent task for the state-of-the-art classical supercomputer would take approximately 10,000 years. And this quantum processor did it in 200 seconds. So when we spoke about uh, uh, science fiction, George Lucas, uh, Star Wars, and so on, so uh, what we are discussing here is changes that are happening right here, right now. And uh, we are not entirely sure about uh, what kind of world we are going to have, not in 10 years' time, but maybe in two or three years' time. So having said that, uh, and launched this uh, as a... Not, not as a provocation, but as a food for thought about the importance of this debate, actually. Uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Agiwara uh, in order to uh, uh, set a little bit the scene about uh, artificial intelligence and where do we stand and which are the consequences for competition policy. Yes. Yeah, please. <coughs> Where, where is it? No. Uh, you have your microphone? No. Yeah, yeah. I talk about the AI and competition based on the uh, patenting activity. Uh, it's a report, uh, report by the uh, World, Input, uh, World, World Intellectual Property Rights Organization, WPO, made a report this January says that the technology trend in 2019, artificial intelligence. And first, uh, as Joseph said, uh, a quantum computers uh, article was issued last month. And I, uh, this morning, I browsed it. I, I don't understand at all, but I, <laughs> I focus, just focus the authors. Uh, it was 78 authors. And uh, almost of them are Google, uh, uh, Google staff and uh, many uh, 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 United States universities. And it is included two German university professors. Uh, so <coughs> uh, Google, uh, of course, the Google is a United States company. And uh, many of leaders are United States. So uh, <coughs> I will check by the uh, patenting activity. Uh, first short history is uh, <coughs> of AI is uh, 2056 uh, when I was born. The artificial intelligence world was born as well. And uh, after two, uh, 20 years, uh, there are some, something gold age of artificial intelligence. Uh, but later, the there is fast, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, the uh, first AI winter, that because uh, uh, AI artificial intelligence was a concept was made, but the supporting computer, computer uh, ability is not so well. So it was a fast winter. Then uh, next. Next boom was expert system during the 1980 to 87. Then again, the second winter, the <coughs> expert system could not show good performance. 
And then, uh, after 2000, uh, two, 19, two, uh, 1993 to currently, uh, accessibility of AI comes back. Uh, for example, IBM had uh, made a deep blue, which defeat chess champion, and Amazon made an automatic uh, recommendation, and Apple made a Siri, and <coughs> uh, IBM was a beat quiz champion. And the ability of computer is quickly growing. And recently, uh, there is a big data, and machine learning is a hot topics. Uh, Google made a driver, driverless automatic, drive, uh, automatic cars, and uh, Google also uh, made AlphaGo, which defeat uh, Go. Uh, Go is a boarding, boarding game, and it defeated a uh, world champion. And uh, yes, uh, last month, uh, Google made a quantum computers. Uh, top, key, uh, top key player, uh, there are three uh, 30 uh, players uh, shown. Uh, sorry, uh, the figure uh, one is very small, but <coughs> uh, uh, focus on the color. This color is United States. This color is EU, uh, Siemens, Bosch, Philips, Nokia, and this color is Japan. Uh, Toshiba, NEC, and so on. And uh, other, other players are China. State Grid Corporation of China is a, a state-owned enterprise. And, it, and power, power, power generation company. And Ch uh, Chinese Academy of Science. And uh, <coughs> uh, Baidu, uh, Sidan University and Zhejiang University. So uh, academic and SOE is a major player in China. And the <coughs> uh, other one is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Samsung, LZ, and uh, some uh, research institute in Korea. Uh, <coughs> so uh, they, uh, they divide three fields, uh, basic technology, AI technique, and uh, AI function application. AI technique may, uh, co includes uh, machine learning and deep learning, logic learning. And AI functional application is uh, 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 computer vision, natural language processing, and speech processing, uh, like uh, Siri, like that. And AI application field is transportation, automatic car, and life and medical science and business, and so many fields. Uh, first, uh, AI techniques. Uh, top <coughs> top patenters, uh, top applicants are here, and second one is here. And uh, as as you see, many uh, United States company, mainly IBM and Microsoft, and uh, uh, and Alphabet. Alphabet is a, a company uh, run by Google. And and the Japanese company only Omron is topic a top one in fuzzy logic, and German company Siemens is good at neural network, logic programming, and fuzzy logic. So United States is a top runner, and, and also CAS, Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, state grid company of Ch uh, China is a big player. And next, uh, functional application. This thing is almost uh, uh, rather different. IBM Microsoft is biggest, and the Japanese company, uh, Toshiba, Toyota, uh, Sony, and many electronics company, and NTT, and uh, Ah, yeah. and Toyota are the main player. And uh, I couldn't find uh, EU companies. Sorry. 
And last one is the applica AI application field. Uh, transportation, personal devices, uh, life and medical science, uh, business, telecommunication, security, and so on. And um, <coughs> Microsoft and IBM is big player. And GMN Sweeps is good at life and medical science and energy management, uh, Chinese company and Siemens, and physical science and engineering, Siemens. And uh, <coughs> yeah, other one is uh, uh, rather small. <coughs> uh, totally, uh, uh, all AI patenting companies, uh, top, uh, top group is United States, uh, IBM, Microsoft, Alphabet, uh, Google, and the number is uh, second number. Uh, num second one is uh, Samsung, LG, Korean company. There are a lot of Japanese companies <coughs> uh, and uh, EU companies. Siemens uh, and Bosch is here and China. This is a whole uh, whole view of companies patenting and. Uh, uh, there are another uh, group is University and in, uh, Public Research Institute. Uh, Chinese Academy of Science is a top, and Zhejiang University, Tsinghua University, and so on. Uh, they are Chinese Academy, and Korean Academy, uh, and United States, and German and France, and Japan. Uh, originally, the research institute, uh, uh, academia, is uh, fast, faster than company in uh, research papers. But this is a patenting activity, so it is not not the <coughs> uh, not the future future figure. But uh, current, currently, Chinese universities are quite focused in industrialization of AI technologies. Uh, in summary, uh, United States, uh, IBM, Microsoft, and Alphabet are champions in many fields, and Japan, patenting by many companies and the uh, <coughs> largest number of patents, but uh, it is not the champion in, uh, in many fields, only one, fi uh, one or two fields in uh, and uh, <coughs> no, uh, computer vision, language and pro uh, speech processing, and performance, performance in academia. In, in case of EU, GMS and good both shows good performance, but relatively few companies are engaged in AI company. And Korea is Samsung LG, and China is <coughs> state grid company of cooperation of China and uh, Baidu and in academia. My implication is, uh, as I said, <coughs> uh, uh, EU, is for, EU is falling behind uh, United States and Japan in patenting activity. So it, EU should invest more in AI research. And uh, China. China is, at this moment, <coughs> a big player is a state-owned enterprise and academia. But <coughs> uh, they will increase. Uh, my, my expectation is they will increase more. And uh, I, I didn't talk about the big, uh, this, this point, accessibility of big data. Uh, currently, GAFA in the United States own their own big data. And China has uh, good access to one billion Chinese people. So they have a chance to use big data. But we, uh, Japan, EU, has limited access, uh, especially on privacy issues. So we have to be the worldwide rule to make a data prote protection. That, that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Aguilara. It's a very interesting uh, uh, overview, uh, definitely uh, setting the scene about uh, what, uh, what are the challenges for, for Europe, I mean, especially, I mean, but also the challenges for Japan, because you show that uh, 
within the fact that there are a lot of patents from Japan, there is still like some lagging behind in terms of uh, a leading role on specific uh, sectors. So that's very interesting. And the other part that I found extremely, uh, like probably something that would uh, uh, deserve a full debate is about the China data. But what does it mean, the fact that uh, all these patents are coming from the universities? Does it mean that uh, basically in, in some years time, this will switch to the commercial side and what it means in terms of innovation. So uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, challenges uh, ahead. Um, on this, I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, Grazia Cerere and uh, uh, have a little bit of a look on uh, the economic implications of artificial intelligence more on a broader level. Uh, thank you very much, Grazia. So, um, is working? Yes. Okay, just check. Okay. So thank you very much for this invitation. I really appreciate your talk. It was very interesting, and um, I learned a lot also. So my per the discussion, um, my presentation is a bit different compared to what has been done uh, so far. And I'm looking, and um, I thank you because you give a very good introduction to my talks because I'm really looking at the implication on the use of artificial intelligence for the economics of privacy and digital economy. So I am Professor Institute of Intelecom in the Business School. I am very pleased to be here. Uh, so I so um, in economics, uh, we know that uh, artificial intelligence, I mean, it's now the, it's uh, uh, identified as a general purpose technology because it can be used in many different fields. I will show to you some of the application. And uh, there are promise for, for growth and um, a good performance. And I will, we will dis, we'll see that this uh, 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 a positive uh, implication to use artificial intelligence can have some shortcomings. So I'm focused on those shortcomings. And uh, there are different of papers. I cited uh, the recent paper of Gorfa Brace Quarter. And uh, I mean, we already saw that artificial intelligence is matching and surpassing human performance. So what Giuseppe was saying at the beginning is just something that we already know. And uh, we know that there are two main applications, economics. So we can see that machine learning can be used uh, for predicting purpose and uh, can be used also to study outcome of algorithmic decision. So uh, my focus is really on the second part, so study the outcome of this algorithm machine learning uh, dec um, decision, which has implication for maybe collusion performance, discrimination, and there are plenty of studies that the, the literature in economics is very emerging, so there are plenty of research topics that needs to be deal. Um, I mentioned, for example, looking at the collusion, there is a nice paper written by uh, some Italian co-author, uh, University of Bologna, Emilio Cal Calvano is co-author, where they perform uh, a, a software, an algorithm which try to learn about um, other algorithm behavior. Basically, what they show that the algorithm learn to collude in, and that can have an important implication for, uh, for competition policy. If we then apply this, uh, uh, alg the use of algorithm to pricing, for example, in digital platforms. So, and then my, my discussion will more focus on the, the implication for discrimination and performance of an algorithm applied in uh, digital economics. Uh, okay. So um, what the literature has shown so far, so we saw that uh, uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, are using very different fields. There is plenty of paper on advertising showing that machine learning algorithms are very good in performing advertising because they better for, uh, machine learning can better forecast who are the better consumers that can be interested in particular goods. There is a nice paper written by Carl, uh, uh, Clamberry Scotter uh, where they show that uh, a good algorithm can even improve the decision of a judge. And they use the data from uh, the Court of Justice of uh, New York where they show that uh, the machine learning can uh, improve the decision of the judge because the, the algorithm discriminates less than the judge, and we can, which is very good for uh, minorities. In the health, we saw that, for example, a nice paper of Gleiser's quarter where they, uh, they perform 
They used uh, the data on EJ, a restaurant hygiene inspector in the US. They took all the data of this, uh, um, this uh, public service in the US. And then uh, they calibrated an algorithm to see whether the algorithm can um, uh, better uh, predict the behavior of these restaurants if they can do better than the, the actual inspection, as an inspector. And they showed that the algorithm was very good in doing a better job. In the international trade, is a very nice paper of uh, Brian, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Schultz, a co-author, where they show that um, the introduction of um, a machine translation in eBay has a, has a very impressive uh, uh, impact on the on the in, in the imp in export on the platform. And so basically, they show that introduce uh, just simple machine learning tool like a trans automatic translation increase the export as well as an important implication for economic growth. And then another uh, nice paper, which is the paper of Mulinata and his co-author, where they show that uh, algorithm can even produce the price of mark housing market. So basically it can be used and can have a very interesting um, use and positive implication in different sectors. Okay? But all this comes with uh, some um, important economic implication. First of all, all this artificial intelligence, if especially applied then in the in digital economics, uh, should use uh, use uh, need to uh, to perform better per users' personal data, which has of course implication for economic privacy, and this is a big issue also in Europe with the new regulation. And then they should have, uh, can be have access to open data, which also has an implication for the business model of the company, who is going to gain the money from this. I know that uh, all public institutions uh, in the room and outside are very big concern on that because we know that there are uh, this data, the data that uh, publi uh, public authorities has, like I don't know, hospital or uh, research centers, are extremely valuable. We are, we are pushing them to have an open access, which is good for growth, which is good for many reasons, but which are the implications, then who is going to get money, which are the business models. So it is an open research question, of course. I have no answer for that. And uh, here I'm presenting what I'm doing, in particular on, on these fields, and I'm interested on, the, on how um, uh, to, to measure how and whether the algorithm using by internet company uh, can really, as a, as a policy, always positive uh, implication for the competitiveness and ensure the growth. In particular, I'm looking at uh, the use of uh, and the implication of uh, ad distribution in social media. And here I'm referring to a, a nascent literature in economics, which show whether the distribution of uh, of advertising or information in social media or in internet, on search engine, is biased or not. And it's a, I mentioned here the nice paper of Sweeney, which um, um, she's a professor at Harvard University. And uh, basically what she showed, uh, she uh, ran a kind of a field experiment to see whether um, the search on black sound name in the US was uh, um, oriented toward a particular type of people. And what she showed is basically that each time she put on a Google search a black sound name, the result that she has was uh, associated to a criminal record, which is, was not the case for white sound name. So basically, what it does suggest is that the algorithm that provide advertising information Google was uh, calibrated with the bias data where uh, basically suggesting the black sound pe black people were associated with the criminal act, which, which of course has important policy implication in terms of discrimination. It might also offset the potential benefits of this kind of tools. That did a similar field experiment on Google where they, um, they post a job advertising uh, for um, different field, in particular in one of these uh, field experiments, they showed that uh, um, once uh, the, um, 
he post, they post uh, the advertising job for high paid job. The, um, the advertising was more shown to men than for women because women earn less, so they are not interested in high, better paid jobs, so which is an important also implication. And then uh, the paper which I'm more close who with is the paper on Lambrecht and Tucker who basically run a field experiment in any country in the world for uh, um, STEM and technology, uh, STEM jobs with sort of science, technology, economics, and, and engineering and mathematics job. And basically what they showed is that uh, this HUD, which was shown, um, was uh, uh, distributed by Facebook, was shown more to men than, to for, than for women. Why? It's because uh, Women, first of all, are less interesting maybe to that, or maybe because uh, there are high ball spillover. Basically, the algorithm learn that advertisers for this kind of job are more interesting to men than to women, just to replicate. And uh, let's uh, you know, many of you know which are the effort of uh, the public of the. OECD, but all public in institutions from the university to increase the number of women in these fields. So basically it means that all the, our effort in terms of, um, of increasing women enrolled in these um, this fields are just um, Put, in one sense, reduce this benefit because all the teenagers and students receive ads which are maybe uh, just not uh, uh, just uh, perform, just for example, perform, showing women always ad related to job related to women job and not to men job. Okay, so my contribution to this literature, so maybe. So what we did is we ran ourselves and all the experiment and um, a field experiment, so an ad on Facebook for an engineer school. And uh, with the objective, this engineer school wants to increase the number of women enrolled in this engineer school because they were just a 2%. And uh, so we ran another campaign and we focus on teenagers because we believe that those are spending a huge amount of time online and those are easily manipulated, which has an important implication. So we have to be careful because this algorithm usually provide, usually provide information to these individuals because they spend a huge amount of time on the internet, and not only teenagers but also children. And uh, we target high school students. And what we show basically is that the HUD was less shown to girls than to, to boys. And uh, we try to. Uh, but we know that in the literature already this result was shown. What we did is we tried to push the algorithm to go toward the women, and we had, we had this is the algorithm, the ad that we showed was exactly the same to the control treatment group. We divided our sample of high school in two, and basically what we had to the treatment of the world for women, and basically the, our objective was to push the algorithm, to prompt the algorithm to show more data to, the, uh, to women. The results are straightforward and easily seen in one slide is that the treatment, so the ad that was aiming to prompt, prompt women um, was a show more or less to boys and men, showing that basically the ad seems suggest that the ad, um, the algorithm of Facebook, because we run this uh, advertising on Facebook, um, associated the word for women to something which is less interesting for boys and for men. So basically, any, so that's my, um, our studies uh, show that many field experiments should be run to understand all the possible shortcomings on the use of in distribution information on social media. Um, yeah. okay. Thank you very much, Grazia. Um, very, very interesting uh, um, take, uh, especially uh, I would like to link it a little bit with what we uh, were discussing before uh, in terms of uh, uh, implications for the regulators, because one of the key questions that were at the end of the last presentation is what is the role of the EU and Japan in all this and one of the role that we can play uh, on the two sides uh, is definitely the regulation aspect and when the regulator comes in obviously there are all sets of, uh, of implications that they are for the society 
on one hand and for competition policy on the other. And sometimes we shouldn't see those two things as two separate boxes, but actually they should be uh, regulated harmoniously together. And um, what, what, what Grazia's uh, presentation showed is uh, uh, quite a lot on, uh, again, the issue of data and the fact of uh, who owns the data and uh, the, that very link to competition yeah. policy in terms of monopoly and who collects and so on. But on the other hand as well, the transparency of, uh, of the algorithms and the bias, because the algorithm at the end of the day is uh, written by human beings. So uh, the fact that the human factor within artificial intelligence is still there, it's one of the big questions. It goes also more philosophical when it comes to quantum computing and the possibility of artificial intelligence at some point to totally disconnect from the human interaction. But that's, let's say, for even a further uh, kind of reflection in, um, in time. Having said that, I would like now to uh, uh, invite uh, Yuko Kawai to, um, to, to present and basically uh, uh, go a little bit uh, more on uh, a specific case study within uh, the different sectors of economy, specifically the financial sector and the financial industry, and see how artificial intelligence and finance are going to, uh, to apply on that specific uh, um, domain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, the, I'm not from academia. Uh, the, what I'm going to present uh, from now is the... As, um, uh, somebody, as the moderator said, that it's going to be a practical cases uh, where the artificial intelligence are in full use in some countries and changing the whole structure of the industry, which is finance industry. It's not a small industry, it's a large industry, but it's completely being changed in some countries. So uh, let me first like touch upon the, uh, give the base, uh, the, give the base uh, to, the, uh, to what I'm going to discuss. Okay? So fintech, uh, fintech, fintech really became the buzzword uh, in 2014 and 2015. Um, that means financial te finance and technology, but te technology is nothing, nothing new in the finance industry. Instead, uh, the, the we've been using ATM, we've been using like electric, electric remittance and so forth. But uh, what has completely changed the picture was the, was the introduction of the smartphone, the penetration of the smartphone, which is not a phone, but it's, uh, it's a computer uh, that the, each, each person can bring along. And also the cloud, uh, which enables the uh, en enables the uh, the data to be accumulated in in, um, in a huge in a, in a huge in, in a huge quantity, and also the AI, uh, which strongly enhance, the enhances the uh, analytics analytics of the data. So evolution of the fintech. I mean, what you see and what we see in Europe and in, in Japan is to the extent that the fintech is making my life more convenient. Like we have some accessibility, accessibility to, to the personal loans, which we didn't have before. The way the remittance and payments are getting more like convenient. The cashless payments are like more ready, ready available. But in some countries, it has completely changed the landscape. Um, say. Uh, the, the examples are this, like you, can, you can just uh, send and receive money without bank accounts, that's one of them. The other is that the, 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 those like finance services are combined with many non-financial services. Uh, you can do like many things in just one click uh, to your smartphone application. So uh, the example is this one, this is that in China. So what's happening in China is this. Um, Payment, I mean, nobody had cared payment like up until three years ago, but payment has become really sexy these days. Like everybody really wants to do the payments. By offering the, the, uh, the payment, and also the, there is no, like almost no cost associated with the payments for the users now. So how, does, how do Chinese do that? Uh, the, I say for example, I am a user, I have the smartphone and I have digital account on the, based on the smartphone. I bring the money from my bank account into, this, uh, uh, into this, this digital account, and I pay money to shops, my friends, and somewhere else, mainly it, uh, using those digital technology. And then finally, I'm, I may retrieve money, or the, my, uh, the, my, the person who received my money uh, may retrieve the money out of the system and then, like, uh, then deposit with the bank. So what's happening here within this circle is that accumulation of the data. 
it really accumulates the data of my Ds and my counterparts Ds and, and with like many other associated data, like where I am, how much I spend, when I spend, and so forth. So this big data now has a value. Say, I mean, the, in the previous presentations, I mean, AI was used for many things like healthcare, advertisement, and so forth. These big data is being used for many things as well. Advertisement, e-commerce, and it, it's used to sell like other financial products which has, which has higher margins, or it gives you the credit scoring so that you can borrow money based on your deeds and so forth. So uh, this big data is now being monetized fully because uh, the, those, I mean, this company, this platform company, digital platform company in China can accumulate data of the payments and associated information. So but how it looks like when you're on your smartphone is like this. This is one of the large providers, which is Alipay in China. You see, I mean, you, you click into this, study, into this digital platform, the screen on your smartphone just by one click. And then you can do like many things, I mean, very many things. Like you can do remittance payments, investment, shopping coupons, Uber, and also like pay utility bills. I mean, you can even pay taxes on this. And I mean, you can, you can obtain credit scores, as I mentioned. So like recently, it's so fashionable for the Chinese youngsters to bring his own credit score to the dating so that he can, off he can just certify that he is capable of marriage. So I mean, that's, that's what's happening in China. So basically, I call it as a social innovation. The, the Chinese people now can have an access to many things which they didn't have an access before uh, with, this, with this system. So cash almost vanishes in big, big cities. I mean, when you visit China, you will never, never see cash on the, uh, in the cities. And platform really aggregates the customer data and analyze and offer you many things I mean, which, which you didn't have before, and you didn't have an access before. And of course, the, uh, the system or the, the, those uh, consumptions or the, those offering of the services became so effective because it's based on data now. <clears throat> it needs some time to, to react, I think. Okay. Let me just skip this one. And so, in other countries, what's happening? When they, other than China, I haven't seen this type of development, which is being offered by non-finance companies, uh, using financial financial services, which is payment, uh, to get to get the base for the big data accumulation. But now Libra comes with Facebook. If the big, I mean, the Libra, I mean, we, we don't know so many things about Libra, and Libra may like fall by, by, its, own, by its own reason. But I mean, can, can it be innovation disruption, given, what we, given what's happening in China? If the big data company or the, the big technology company comes into this finance, in finance, financial services, they have much more capable than the incumbent banks to collect data holistically about anything you do on the digital platform. So that may change the whole, whole scene of the uh, consumption and production and offer, the offering of the data, the, the offering of services in the society. So as far as, if the, we, don't, we, we don't know where the Libra will make, it, make, make its way, but if it does, uh, it's gonna, it may change, it may bring the whole, um, whole set of changes which are now prevailing in China. Okay, um, Libra is proposing a very serious challenge to central banks, including our bank. Like, what is money? And what if, what if Libra becomes the more popular, popular products and the legal tender we are offering to? Like, if it becomes, a, if it replaces Japanese yen, what can central banks do? So in terms of the digital platform, which collects the data, I mean, there are many types of the uh, digital platforms prevailing in the, the happening in, the, in many countries. One is the government-led, uh, which is, I would say, at the happening in India now, and domestic mono oligopoly, that's China, and international oligopoly by tech giants, that's GAFA, and uh, fragmented domestic small data clusters, which may be the case of Japan and maybe in many countries in the EU. Data matters. The more data you have, the more you have, the, the more power you have. The, your AI will getting will, will get more clever. So, 
population matters. Very simple, very simple thing. So you see China, India, and other Asian countries which are printed in red. And of course, and we have some the, the the countries in blue, which are the which are the European countries. So population matters, and of course, the data privacy matters. But I mean, if, but they, and it's it's very important to care about data privacy. But having said that, already the things are happening in China to be followed by India with this magnitude. So we really need to think about this uh, about this uh, in like in discussing what we're going to do. So uncharted territories, yes, uncharted territories. I mean, the, uh, to us, that's the central bank and the financial regulator. Um, mixing finance and non-finance is quite unprecedented. What can we do? Data is the power, and I mean, of course, I mean, the, 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 to collect the data, you need to have contact points, which happen to, happen to be payments uh, in, in China's case, and we need to have storage place and analytic skills. And customers are demanding more. Like they really want to, uh, they really want to have bank become as as convenient as Amazon. And of course, I mean, there is there is a threat of cyber. We are observing and the, uh, there could be the potential risks to the financial system, competition, of course, and cybersecurity, as I said, operational risk, misuse of the data, privacy sensitivity, and governance of the governance of the platformer. I mean, how can we regulate them? How can we monitor the platformer which accumulates the data? Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. So um, that was interesting also to try to, to see how this actually is uh, happening on the real life of people and on a specific uh, field. Um, I would like uh, to uh, start the conversation first among uh, uh, us and the panelists and, um, and, and start with, uh, with some reactions from from you to uh, to your colleague's presentation, um, if um, if some of you would like to to start to have uh, a question to the other, okay. yes, sure. To uh, Dr. Professor Hagiara, yeah. I was really surprised to mm. see uh, the number of the patents in China mm. are only coming from SOE and universities, given that. The, what I observe in the finance industries are that their big techs mm. are using enormous mm. like, range of uh, the artificial intelligences. Mm. Yeah, I feel too. And, uh, but the uh, number of academia patent, mm. is, uh, the scale is different from companies. Okay. So the academy of, uh, Chinese academy, China Academy of Science is big one. And it, I, I think, uh, of course, uh, it, it is a uh, government and aided company. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> so, because you are looking at the U U.S. patents or mm. Chinese patents? I mean, mm. patents I registered in China yeah. or worldwide? Because yeah. maybe they are just patent. They have a different. Uh, Patenting behavior, yeah. or no patenting I, I, I skipped this explanation on patenting office. Uh, there, are, there are very different, uh, quite different among uh, patent office, uh, put Japan patent office or US uh, patent, patent and trademark office, and EU, uh, European patent office. So to, to remove the difference among uh, patent office, uh, they, uh, uh, we use the uh, uh, concept of patent family. Uh, patent family is, uh, for example, Japanese company applied to Japan patent office, mm. but at the same time, uh, if uh, they think it's important in worldwide, then uh, they apply to European patent office too. Mm. So at least two patent office uh, applied patent is an uh, importance and uh, it is a uh, equal footing among companies, uh, countries. So uh, this is a, a quick uh, explanation. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, the question on, on regulation, because, uh, because that, for me, uh, I think is one of the crucial aspects uh, where 
Indeed, Japan and Europe can have uh, a competitive advantage uh, comparing to, to the others. One of the few, uh, let's say, points, uh, according to your, your presentation. Uh, what, uh, maybe especially for us as European audiences, what is the state of uh, the debate around the uh, regulation of artificial intelligence uh, in, in Japan? Uh, and, and how it can connect uh, with the cooperation when it comes to uh, regulations at European level? Mm, at this moment, uh, regulation on AI is, uh, the, is focused on some ethical issue, mm. uh, it, ethical and privacy issue. And uh, it's not uh, made from the point of uh, competitiveness mm. <laughs> among countries. And uh, I don't know much about the GDPR in mm. EU, but uh, Japan should follow. And uh, if, uh, if it's possible, it should be spread over the world. Mm. So J Japan doesn't have a, a regulation similar to GDPR? No, not yet. Not yet. We do you have the consumer, pro consumer data protection law, mm. which is um, basically limiting the companies to get an access to the, 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 the certain set of data, the consumers. Right. right. I see. Um, I may yes, have a question please. for you. Do you think that uh, maybe the financial sector, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, fact, the, the issue with the Libra is, of, of, of course, uh, an issue for all banks worldwide. Do you think that... Uh, Maybe the financial institutions so far, like the Bank of Japan or the Big Bank, um, is a too strong regulation, which maybe you see what I, I mean. Um, maybe you should also transform your sector. I know that financial sector very, and uh, because uh, Libra is one example, but we can have plenty of other companies that decided to have a new money. Why not Twitter? Why not uh, Google or other? Do you see what? So, do you think that uh, well, in terms of financial regulations, I mean, we have the we have all the reasons why we have these strong regulations, um, consumer protections, anti-money laundering, and well, just um, sure fact that we really need to protect the uh, stability of the financial system so that everybody can have a good and safe access to their money when they when they need. So, uh, well, there may be the areas that we are over-regulating, which need to be reviewed, regardless of Libra. But um, what Libra is proposing are like more, I think, much deeper than that, I would say. Not only the regulation, I think. They, what Libra is trying to answer is the demands from the users to do the easier, the cross-border remittance which is what the incumbent, need, incumbent industry needs to answer. Because at this moment, say for example, Bank of Japan has a control over the Japanese yen payment system domestically within Japan, within the border of Japan. But if we want to connect internationally by the remittance, we need to have some, uh, we need to have some facility for the Bank of Japan system to talk to for the reserve system. That is now currently done by the by some incumbent way, which is not super efficient. So that's where Libra is trying to answer, give an answer to. So it's not really the existing regulation, it's more or less the existing structure of what we do. What we do. Though we have to say, as you mentioned, that we don't even know if Libra is going to, to happen in the form that uh, it has been announced uh, due to the recent announcement also of the IMF and so on. So uh, uh, indeed there is a pushback from the central banks yes. in order to uh, keep the, the prerogative of, uh, of issuing uh, the money. And that's, exactly. that's, I think, a debate that will definitely come back. Uh, and, um, but maybe it's not mature enough in, 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 in the field in order to, uh, to have the next step where we are going to have a, a digital currency of that kind. Mm -hmm. So, so it's pretty open. Um, I would like to ask uh, Grazia, uh, um, when you did your research on um, the bias and, and on Facebook, uh, uh, did, you, did you try also to understand a little bit better uh, how this has uh, an economic implication? Because you study advertisements. 
Uh, and so uh, somehow this also connects a little bit with the with the issue of competition policy, and uh, and how uh, you know if you have such a, um, a sort of monopoly on on the social media side, uh, and how the other companies also depends on on this use of data, which is kind of biased. How how this beside the societal implications and the gender bias that uh, that is very interesting. Obviously, I'm, I'm not diminishing that that part of the story, but how actually there is also an economic story out of it and how basically there is a distortion, potential distortion of the market within the advertisement of uh, bias in, in, in this algorithm uh, uh, of, uh, that you started. So thank you so for the question, which is a still open question. I mean, uh, I think there are plenty of economic implications. Uh, first of all is uh, the fact that indeed uh, the use uh, um, of this data, I mean, uh, we, we, we have plenty of uh, issues in terms of regulation of this data. Shall uh, we need to more regulate or not this company? Shall we have to ask to this company to have more uh, information on the algorithm that they use to distribute the algorithm or not? Uh, are uh, really these big firms um, uh, behaving uh, or cooperating. There is a big issue on the fact that, that uh, we, we, there is a big concern on the fact that uh, uh, Facebook, uh, should Facebook use the same data that uh, collect on Facebook to Instagram and to Skype and uh, how they, so I think there are plenty of economic implications. And then uh, for our study in particular, we are still running other experiments uh, in other fields uh, because we believe that as an important economic implication. First of all, uh, if you think uh, at the company perspective, the amount of money that is being spent on advertising, then uh, there's a problem on performance also, because uh, um, we, I, I, I had no time to focus on what we did, but basically we show also that uh, people, uh, women in particular, are extremely interesting on the ad. They usually click more than boys. Mm -hmm. but. Basically, even though they are more interested, they don't, they don't receive many So they can have a problem of performance, also right. the, the tools. Uh, and then also, it's, I think it's a performance of the platform itself. Then the second important implication is for sure the access to information to individuals, because this is an, was an ad for uh, uh, an engineer school. But let's imagine if we run an advertising, I was discussing with someone before and advertising, um, promoting, uh, I don't know, health and vaccine for everybody. Mm -hmm. what, what's happened on the distribution of this? This is an important policy implication. And um, what's happened for political ad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. So um, I would like to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience. I. Uh, uh, you will you will receive a microphone in a second over there, Saffron. Uh, up here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mimi Kim from EU uh, Europe Asia Interlink. I have uh, questions for the professor as well as also uh, someone from the Bank of Japan. Um, I mean, you're talking about competition policy. Um, I'm actually very shocked that EU is so much behind actually in AI. Uh, it's, 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 it's actually nothing new, but I think presented there is very shocking. Um, but for example, uh, given uh, the, the powerhouse of Japan, uh, and the powers of China and followed by Japan and others in, in AI, do you think that uh, Japan and Euro can cooperate, for example, in certain areas concerning associated governance issues. Mm -hmm. That's the number one question. Number two uh, is, for example, for China, uh, in relation to your actually uh, presentation uh, uh, slide that showed actually who are, if you will, uh, in, the, in the, the actual leader role in terms of utilizing data for AI uh, enhancement at China, Amsterdam, and India. Now, China and India combined it together, they are 1.5 each, 3 billion people. So there are generally huge amount of actually data, which is uh, almost like the essence for AI. Now, if you include Indonesia, then we're talking about 
4 billion there already. And the UN actually, uh, uh, US combined, you're not even reaching 1 billion, for example, right? So um, given this sheer size of data power, as you said, um, uh, how do you see, for example, the ethics concerning AI that, that's been promoted here in Europe? Uh, uh, how do you see that actually shaping up? Is there any, for example, uh, cooperation rather than competition that could actually happen between uh, Japan and Europe uh, in relation to shaping up if like governance issues and other issues related to the AI? Thank you. Yep. Who okay. wants to take it first? Uh, this year, the Prime Minister Abe visited Brussels and uh, made a <coughs> joint statement, and the uh, Japan and EU will collaborate on data protection. And uh, the problem is, <laughs> what is uh, content? <laughs> and uh, my, uh, my feeling is uh, data protection uh, should, be, uh, should aim some big data restriction, but uh, uh, Japan and the EU will collaborate, but uh, probably GAFA do not listen to us. <laughs> this is the problem. <laughs> That's all. Mm -hmm. Yuko? Given what's happening, what has happened already in China, I don't think they will listen to us at all. I do not think so. And they are building up and they're uh, developing their own, dis own version of discussion about the ethics and also privacy, even within China. Uh, they care, actually, about the privacy and ethics, but in their own way. Mm -hmm. So I don't think uh, they're going to follow any kind of like Western standards we're going to set up. Having said that, um, I think um, each individual company or each individual region, region like people, people living there, should be given their choices um, for them to choose. I mean, whether they want to have like clean, a better version of the data protection, or they want to go when they go follow through the China version. Economically speaking, of course, China version is much more effective. You just surrender all the data, but, give them the, but you just get the reward back by letting them know who you are. So I think it's just a balance that you need to think about. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please, over there. Thank you very much for the very interesting... Um... Do I need the microphone? I didn't... Yes, oh, because loud. we are okay. live streamed, so... Oh. Um, Star Malmagiri from the UK Perm Rep to the EU. Thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentations. I was wondering what each of the panelists, do each sort of have a different focus? Um, what each of you think the main policy choice that we should be making now to address your specific concerns? I, I was at the WTO public forum the week before last, and I noted that um, the discussion here is the industrial giants, the EU, China, the US, but the developing world in India had a very different view of how data should be treated, how it should be valued. Um, Indian government representatives noted that uh, India generates the data, but GAFA has the data and makes the money from it. What do you think, in light of the challenges that EU and Japan face, the biggest or the best policy choices that individual member states and the EU has as a whole, bearing in mind the different competencies of the two, have to make the most of the opportunities and address the biggest risks in respect of personal, personal data, uh, competition policy, and developing and capitalizing on the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yuko, do you want to? <laughs> well, do you have an yeah. answer? <laughs> if I can answer the question, I will become, I will become a president of the EU. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but as I said, um, the, if you simply talk about the economic results, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the supremacy of the, of the Chinese model is quite imminent. I mean, it's just so apparent, especially in the finance industry. It just beats everything, even GAFA. Like the number of the data they have in their hands are much more than GAFA has. 
And also, uh, it's very interesting that the, uh, one of the big players uh, in China, uh, Alipay, which is a subsidiary of Alibaba, um, has uh, they provided the data platform, the, the platform of, digitized, the, of, of the digitized data to India. So, I mean, the, it's not a dream at all that they're going to combine like 3 billion or 4 billion or 5 billion people's data. So do we want to be a part of that? I mean, that's Japan's choice, I think, because we, can, we, we cannot move ourselves out of Asia. Do we want to be independent from that 5 billion economy, or do we want to, do we want to be a part of that? I think that's the um, question uh, sooner or later will be asked to Japan. I'm not quite sure I mean, what will be the situation in Europe being like remote from China, the, what's happening uh, in Asia. And I'm not quite sure about the choice of the United States, actually, because they may be too small, even the United States. So I think uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's a future question. Well, very near future question. I had some more questions before. No? No, it doesn't seem the case. Um, I would like just just to conclude, maybe uh, just some some wrap up and final uh, final remarks from from each of you, uh, to to give us a little bit of a, your final reflections about the future direction that this should go uh, before we wrap up and go and go for lunch, because it will be I think important for uh, uh, as well setting the tone for the next panel after lunch uh, to to have some. Uh, some food for thought, uh, not only for the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> as I mentioned, as a uh, implication, that uh, EU should strengthen the R&D effort on AI and uh, <clears throat> the data, data protection cooperation between EU and Japan and spread over the world. Hmm. Um, just a follow-up question on this. How do you think that other existing instruments that uh, are in place, like for example in terms of trade agreements and so on, could uh, spill over to this uh, competition uh, just, policy? Just my hope. <laughs> just your hope, okay. But, but not something concrete in mind. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yuko? Okay. Um, I really hope that uh, we can like, set up a um, very good precedent uh, in uh, data protection, uh, the uh, regulations, whatever the framework, and uh, try to make, try to solicit the Chinese people, or try to solicit the Indian people to join us. But uh, I'm not very optimistic about it, given the economic consequence they already are enjoying. Mm. So uh, the what I the what I have. What I am doing and what I am proposing to my peers in the finance industry, not only to the central banking industry but also the others, are that, well, first of all, let's study China. Mm. Mm. And maybe let's study India, which is following China in a different format. And let's see what's happening there. Mm. And let's see what are the wrong mm. things happening there yeah. so that uh, we can come up with the better solution. And then, in the end, we can just present mm. it to present to, it, it, to the world that it's a better solution. Mm -hmm. But unless you know what's happening in China, I don't think you can propose anything yeah. because they are simply overwhelming, mm -hmm. actually. Because, I mean, I, the, the efficiency they are achieving is just so enormous. Mm -hmm. If you see it, you, I mean, you when, say, for example, when I can buy just one hour insurance uh, for, for my, for my like, private trip over to somewhere, just one hour insurance because they have my data. So, I mean, that kind of like efficiency mm. is like never achieved before. Mm. Um, if I may ask as well to you a follow-up question, not specifically on, on that, but on the financial industry uh, part, because uh, you've been focusing quite a lot on, uh, let's say, uh, the final users, like the, the payments and things that, that affects actual uh, people. But uh, uh, how do you think that actually artificial intelligence could affect the financial markets in terms of, uh, uh, you know, automation of other things that are more on the on the um, on other services which are not uh, to the and the end users are not like the um, are not like people but are maybe companies. You see what I mean? Okay. Um, 
let me again talk about the, what's happening in China. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, those digital platformers are touching uh, their client bases where the big data is available, mm -hmm. which means that small and medium term and small and medium sized enterprises are included in their regime, but not big companies mm -hmm. because big companies, I mean, the credit and credit worthiness of the big companies cannot be analyzed by the big data. Likewise, uh, in terms of types of transactions, I mean, if you are talking about small, quant small amount, small notional amount loans, you can do the big data, the, the large number of small, small notionals, but you cannot do the small number of large notionals. So wherever the big data comes, come, wherever the big data can be formulated, there I can come in, and that's what that's how it's developing. Gracias. Yeah, I have four different um, thoughts during uh, for our discussion. So the first issue is that, uh, I mean, data in econ at economic perspective is an intermediate good. So you can put the data as uh, if you have an equation, you have uh, your input, and the data for sure an input. So the issue is uh, how this input is. First of all, uh, there are different studies. It, it, it really, it is an emerging literature, so the, I cannot cite plenty of paper on that topic. But for sure, there are some evidence that there are decreasing return on the, this data. So you don't need always million, million data. It seems that at, upon a certain top, a point, these data are not anymore very good. You don't need too many data in certain cases. And uh, there are some studies try to identify which is this uh, decreasing point at which, uh, upon which time we don't need to collect a huge amount of data. Then there are another issue is that, okay, uh, maybe those companies have plenty of data on our geolocalization or what we used to buy are really, are, are those data that have an economic value? I don't know, maybe some of this data, yes, in the future, because we have also to look at dynamic perspective. The fact that I used to go every, every day at my job is valuable for a company, maybe for Uber, yes, but not for all. So I am a bit, the issue of data was very, very difficult to, to, to. then, uh, uh, so the quality of prediction might decrease over time. So this is the first issue. The second issue is the issue of competition and regulation. I mean, uh, the first, uh, there are very few papers that are, I mean, there are some papers that try to uh, measure the cost of regulation for companies. And the results are very puzzling. A part of this paper showed that in reality, regulation is a cost for a companies. Mm -hmm. And what's happening usually is that the big company has the money to afford the cost this regulation, so high, strict regulation can have a, a negative impact on competition because it can, in one sense, favor big company because they can afford the cost of putting in place a regulation, which is not the case for big or small companies. So we have to extremely be careful on that. And the, 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 there are a few papers now that I, I can think about. One is the paper of Ginger Scott, or Ginger, Ginger Hinn was, she was a chief economist at Federal Trade Commission, and she has a very nice paper where she me measured the access to capital by joint venture in Europe and US before and up after the European regulation framework. And basically, she showed that uh, they show that the European company were uh, uh, were performing less bet less than um, a US company because of the European regulation. There are other studies that have similar uh, results, but we need to wait for this because I mean. And we need more empirical studies for that, and that's important. I think more uh, studies should be done also on the, maybe also the relationship with companies also, maybe also vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Japanese uh, regulation in Europe. And then uh, third and not last but not least, I think that the consumers still maybe like privacy, but they should pay for privacy. And uh, you know, when get, people are getting into free service, and very difficult to ask people to pay for free, because free is free. And uh, so may, may, may I be provocative? Why people should pay for privacy? Maybe privacy can be a business differentiator. Let's imagine we have a new European company that offer a privacy respectful service. Shell consumer wants to pay for that. 
Let's imagine you have a, a two goods, A and B. One is respectful of privacy, the other not. And uh, one why, why the standards shouldn't be respecting of privacy? I mean, like, I'm just asking, just trying no, to be provocative. Uh, the, the, why, know, why, know, why privacy know, should I, be I a mean, good? The, uh, it's very difficult in the world where we are to say, OK, we have everybody to be respectful. Maybe consumer can, can let also consumer give the option. So what I'm saying is maybe policy should create the more option for consumer because maybe there are very few options. No, yes, sir. Yes, I think I see that my provocation has sparked some. Uh... <laughs> yes, well, also we, we, we have a little time, so I'll, I'll uh, even though we supposedly had just moved past the Q and A, I'll toss another one in that's kind of inspired by the discussion we've moved to here. So a lot of the discussion now, I, uh, what I'm hearing really has to do with training data, the corpora. Uh, for, for artificial intelligence, and really all the focus up to now in the discussion has been on, on personal data. And of course, when we talk about privacy, that's really what we're talking about, is personally identifiable data. Um, but there's a lot of other data, and also there are questions. Uh, the, the, the research that you were referencing as well, there are a number of studies that suggest that there are laws of diminishing returns that relate to data. So at a certain point, I mean, the, the, things never go completely flat, um, but at a certain point, you probably have enough. Now, uh, when we get, though, to, to non-personal data, uh, there have been measures taken in the European Union to try to free up access to non-personal data by companies mm -hmm. to make it easier to distribute it around, data that doesn't trigger um, uh, privacy concerns. And also, there's a whole other large area that, that ties into smart city initiatives as well, and that has to do with use of publicly available data. Uh, here, there has been work undertaken in the European Union over the past years, uh, you know, most of which I think hasn't shown effects yet, but maybe it's too soon, to try to open up public data, non-personally uh, non identifiable public data, make it available, because that's also a form of training corpus, corpora, for, uh, for artificial intelligence. And, uh, and there, there's probably a lot of data within the European Union uh, and I would think also in Japan, that could be turned loose, all kinds of things that have to do with scheduling of public transport, all sorts of things that probably relate to climate and environment. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the fact that we have fewer people, well, that's not something we're going to do anything about in the near term, right? The, the demographics are what they are. There's only a limited amount that we will change or that we want to change. Um, but on these other forms of data, there's probably quite a lot that can be done. Right. So I, I would toss that out to, you know, for the panel to think about. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Scott. And I, I'm Scott Marcus Bruegel. Sorry, I for, forgot to identify myself. I'm Scott Marcus from Bruegel. And Scott, and Scott will be in uh, the panel this afternoon, so we'll hear more from him. I had another uh, finger over there. Um, yeah, well, it was sparked from you. Like I'm talking now as an individual and saying, um, should it be really uh, like public security or pu like the protection of um, the public be a good for the rich? Because if we say like like there are people who maybe can pay for it, and then if they are not protected, I mean like maybe we shouldn't we shouldn't say like yeah let it be the private sector and like pay for your privacy because we are already putting like a lot of data in, inside of the, in the, in the internet and in the hub. And the other thing I was thinking was, was like if AI is controlling the single market and we have like a lot of data from the China and India sector, which is like not considering like it's a technical term, um, the anonymity in the data mining. So like someone who's like out of the out of the box and like then he he has to adjust to that new market and then we can't even secure like individuals who don't fit in a system. And if the IE is telling the, the person, yeah, you're an anomaly you just don't fit anymore, then we have another issue in the single market, just to point it out. Indeed, very, very good and interesting uh, uh, reflections and very relevant for, for the discussions to come, which are definitely not going to be closed right here, right now. I, I would even add something uh, like maybe starting uh, going back to my starting point about quantum quantum computing and uh, 
the not knowing what will be uh, the future and how this, uh, this new uh, computing power would affect uh, all of us, I, I wonder even if our discussions that we are having now uh, in a few years' time will be totally obsolete and maybe we will be here discussing something even more uh, forward-looking like uh, complete automation, like now we're st starting to discuss automations of jobs, automations of other things, but maybe at some point we are going to discuss automations of the entire markets uh, or the entire financial sector. And, uh, and these kind of discussions might lead to uh, many other um, unknown uh, um, challenges and questions for, for human beings. So with, with this to say, I would like to thank the, the panelists and thank all of you. Um, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, but uh, uh, however, I, I, I think that lunch will be outside. If it's not outside yet, it's just about to be served. Uh, so I would like to actually, I see, that lunch is outside, so that's very good news for all of you. Um, I would like to, to invite you to uh, uh, also take this time to uh, network and uh, continue the discussion with uh, all of us uh, during the break and uh, uh, get ready for interesting uh, uh, sessions this afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye.